Chapter 5 is called Furniture Forest. Darkus couldn't return to school because Uncle Max had told them he was sick with a high temperature. On the way home, they stopped at a pet shop and Uncle Max bought him a bag of oak wood mulch for Mark Baxter's tank. Back at the flat, Darkus carried the newly cleaned aquarium to the yard behind Uncle Max's flat. Placing it on the concrete slabs, uh, on the concrete steps, sorry, that led down to the overgrown scrub that was, had once been a lawn, he filled it halfway up with the mulch. Then he gathered pieces of bark from about the yard to lay on top. In the centre of the tank, he lent three strips of bark against each other to create an earthy nook, trying to make a beetle habitat like the ones he'd read about in his red book. How come I didn't know that Dad loves beetles? Darkus wondered out loud as he arranged the leaves and sticks around the edge of Baxter's tank. It's weird. I know he likes custard creams and cats and cycling. He turned and looked at Baxter, who was crawling along the concrete step beside him. Don't you think it's weird? He paused. He paused as if listening for Baxter's response, then shook himself. I'll tell you what is weird. Talking to beetles. That's weird. He picked up the mug of milk Uncle Max had brought down for him before he'd gone to work and drained it. After Mum died, Dad had lost interest in everything, and there were times when Darkus thought he didn't care anything about anything anymore, not even him. So perhaps it wasn't so strange that he'd stopped being interested in beetles. Darkus looked down at Baxter. Insect hunting sounds fun, eh? He put down the empty cup. Cup. When we find Dad, I'm going to make him take us. Baxter marched up to Darkus's mug and rammed it with his horn. The mug rocked. Hey, what's that cup ever done to you? Baxter butted it again, knocking it over. Darkus watched fascinated as the beetle jammed his horn under the cup and lifted it, clattering it against the wall of the tank. What did you do that for? Darkus righted the mug. Baxter moved his horn slowly from left to right, then headbutted the cup again, knocking it back onto its side. He spread his elytra and lifted into the air, tugging at the handle of the mug with his claws. You want me to pick it up, Darkus offered. Is that right? Baxter flew into the tank and looked up expectantly. In there with you. Darkus placed the mug beside Baxter. The beetle set about pushing the mug into the wigwam of bark Darkus had made, then reversed in and out several times. What's that? Darkus scoffed. A bedroom? Baxter reared up, lifting his thorax and front legs, waggling them at Darkus, as if delighted at being understood. It is a bedroom, Darkus laughed. Since when did beetles need bedrooms? Baxter tilted his head cockily as if to say, you know nothing. Darkus was about to argue, then tr chuckled and clapped his hand to his forehead. He was not going to quarry with, quarrel with an insect. Sometimes he really thought that he was communicating with the beetle, even though that was impossible. He instinctively knew that Baxter, what Baxter wanted, or at least he felt like he did. If Darkus played close attention, the beetle's movements made sense to him, and at times he was sure Baxter was trying to tell him things, like in the museum, museum with the la yellow ladybird. He wondered what Uncle Max would say if he told him. Although perhaps that wasn't a good idea. Uncle Max already behaved like he didn't trust Baxter, which Darkus thought was unfair. Baxter was, was just a beetle after all, and it wasn't his fault he was cleverer and more special than ordinary beetles. Dad would have made him prove it. He was forever telling Darkus to be scientific in his approach to things. Life is a mystery, son, and science the tool for understanding it, was Dad's stock response to every puzzle, even when that puzzle was something as ordinary as trying to find his other shoe. Darkus used to groan when Dad used that phrase, but right now he would have given anything to hear it. Of course, Darkus sat up straight. I should do a scientific experiment to see if Baxter really can understand me. That's what Dad would do. He looked about in the dirt at the bottom of the steps. If he was going to prove that him and Baxter could understand each other, he needed to find another ordinary beetle and set up a control test. Using a stick, he scratched around in the flower bed beside the steps. He didn't find any beetles there, so he lifted a stone and found a collection of wood lice having a meeting. You'll have to do, he said, picking one off the stone and watching it roll into a tight ball in his palm. Don't be frightened, I'm not going to eat you. He picked up Baxter in his other hand, placing him and the woodlouse towards the back of one of the concrete steps. Now, when I let you both go, he said slowly and clearly, I want you to stay exactly where you are, okay? 
Go. Neither creature moved. Darker stared at the woodlouse, willing it to take a step forward. Nothing happened. Okay, this time, he said, picking up both insects again, when I put you down, I want you to crawl to the edge of the step and then stop. Again, he placed the insects at the back of the step. For a second, neither of them moved, but then Baxter started crawling forward. Yes, come on, Baxter. Darkus felt a rush of pleasure as the beetle moved towards him. Then the woodlouse scurried forward. Both insects stopped when they got to the edge of the step and Darkus scratched his head. So far, he was proving nothing. The woodlouse turned and crawled away along the edge of the step. Ha! I asked you to stop when you got to the edge of the step, not crawl sideways, Darkus Dark said triumphantly to it. Just as Baxter fell face first over the edge of the step, landing on his back with his legs waggling in the air. Oh, are you okay, Baxter? He picked up the rhinoceros beetle and returned him to his tank, feeling deflated. You're pretty clumsy, did you know that? Deciding to give up on the experiments, he peeled the banana that Uncle Max had brought with his milk, broke off a lump and placed it in the tank beside Baxter. Dad's beetle book said that rhinoceros beetles eat fruit and tree sap, and he discovered that Baxter was particularly fond of bananas. As he watched the beetle scramble onto the banana, he wondered for the millionth time that day where his dad could be, what his disappearance had to do with beetles, and what Lucretia Cutter, that strange angry woman on sticks, had to do with his father. His thoughts were interrupted by sounds of banging and shouting from the other side of the garden wall. The neighbours were fighting again. You traitorous snake, open this door! There was a loud bang. If you don't open it, I'll, I'll break it down. I'd like to see you try, you little weasel. Humphrey roared with laughter. The council are coming at the end of the week. Well, you'd better get a move on and start clearing the yard then, hadn't you? It's your rancid said pit of a bedroom that's the real problem. I'll clean my, up my room once you've cleared the yard. Just kill those blasted beetles, you slob. Darkus leapt to his feet. Beetles? There were more beetles next door. He looked at the rhinoceros beetle happily eating the banana in his tank. It had never occurred to him that there may be more beetles where he'd come from. What if they were special too, like Baxter? He ran down to the dilapidated shed at the bottom of the garden, stepping up onto the rotting windowsill and then pulling himself onto the mossy roof before scrambling along the wall and lying flat on the top of it. He couldn't help but let out a low whistle of surprise as he looked down into the yard on the other side. It was crammed full of furniture. Uncle Max had told him the neighbours were hoarders, but he'd never seen anything like this before. The yard was piled high with junk. It looked as if a mob of brawling furniture had been frozen with a ray gun. Table and chair legs stuck out, their feet like clenched fists about to land a punch. A brave hat stand was making a break for it at the south side of the yard, held back by tendrils of bindweed. Wardrobes cowered beneath tarpaulin. Naked lampstands were bound together with rope. Bed springs pinged out of mattresses and a giant bathtub reared up in the middle of the yard, a pink scooter dangling helplessly from its taps. Cool, Darkus breathed out, immediately wanting to explore. Near the building itself, a towering sycamore tree reached up past the window where the shouting was coming from. There were enough leaves on the sycamore tree to hide Darkus, and if he had to run, there were plenty of hiding places in the furniture. The sky was bloated with charcoal-coloured clouds, and daylight was fading. The darkness would provide even more cover. He glanced back at the flat. Uncle Max wouldn't be back from work till after six. Without another thought, Darkus dropped down into the forest of furniture, determined to climb the sycamore tree and get a peek into the room, that room. As his feet touched the tabletop, there was a loud sprinting, splintering sound, and he launched himself sideways, swinging on the arm of a vertical sofa, sliding down its upright seat and landing on a pile of faded cushions that far... Uh, that... Uh, um, lifted out a cloud of mildew. Darkus froze, listening. Humphrey, do you hear me? Pardon? Humphrey made a noise like a cat coughing up a hairball. You need to speak up a bit. You know very well what I said, you brain-dead warthog. Open up this door immediately. Now, that's not very nice, is it? Humphrey replied in a sugary voice, calling me a warthog. 
Darko set out a sigh of relief. They hadn't heard him. He crawled off along the back of a wooden cupboard in the direction of the voices. Beside a stack of side tables was a narrow gap. He squeezed his legs into it, his feet finding the ground, and standing sidled along until the gap widened and met a bookshelf filled with boxes of cassette tapes, comics and rotting toys. A memory came back to him of being little and nestling between two stacked armchairs. He'd gone to an auction with his mum and dad and crawled into the furniture when they weren't looking. He heard their alarmed voices calling out for him and saw again the relief on both their faces when he poked his head out of the furniture and waved. Sadness washed through his body. He shook his head to dissolve the memory and squatted down, slithering forward on, through an avenue of chair legs, pulling himself over an aggressive thistle, and gritting his teeth as it, jumped, pulled, as it tore at his jumper. He came out in a cupboard-sized clearing. Stretched overhead was a tarpaulin, blocking out the daylight and protecting a tall grandfather clock that would set forever say it was quarter to nine. He pulled open the door in its body and it came away in his hand. Inside was a rust-speckled pendulum and a mass of shredded paper. The pointy nose of a mouse peeped out and then two beady black eyes looked up at him. Sorry, Darkus whispered, placing the door back in its frame. You could build a brilliant dell in the middle of all this furniture, he thought. Stepping through a curtain of ivy hanging from a wardrobe rail, no, would, no one would ever know you were here. He wondered if Virginia and Bertolt liked dens. Building one was more fun if you had people to do it with. As he went, Darkus opened drawers, cupboards and boxes, finding tongs, an ornate hand mirror and even a set of false teeth. He left everything as he found it, keeping the location of the sycamore tree to his, in his head. Sliding over a desk and under a bed frame, he came nose to nose with a fox. They stared at one another, neither of them moving. The fox blinked unbothered and walked away through the middle of a stack of empty picture frames. I'm warning you, Humphrey Gamble, this is your last chance. Oh no, boo-hoo, I'm so scared. Either you open this door or I'm coming in. The voices were closer now. Darker saw a black front door with a silver number 73 screwed to it. He turned the handle. Behind it was a kitchen dresser. He scrambled up the dresser, using the shelves like rungs on a ladder, and found that from the top he could see across the yard. The tree was three metres away. Darkus plotted a path through the furniture that would lead him straight there. Dropping back down into the maze, he wormed his way forward until he arrived at, under a fold-away table opposite the sycamore tree. Beyond the tree, a tangle of bicycles obscured the black wall of the shop. He thought about his own bicycle. It was in the shed at home, sitting unused outside his empty house, south of the river in Crystal Palace. He felt, it felt like a lifetime since he'd been there and happy. The familiar tide of sadness rose in his chest and he felt homesick for the, first, for the time before Dad had disappeared. Unwanted tears sprang into his eyes. Angrily, he pushed his feelings aside, scrambling out into the open and sprinting to the tree. He jumped up, catching hold of the lowest branch, swung his legs up and climbed swiftly up the tree. When he reached up, uh, when he arrived on the branch opposite the window, his heart was pounding in his chest. At first he couldn't make sense of what he was looking at. The wooden window frame was empty of glass, which explained how he'd heard the two men quarrelling. And all over the wood and surrounding brickwork, unnoticeable from the ground, were hundreds of red ladybirds. There were so many of them scurrying around the window frame that it looked like it was moving. Darker smiled. These ladybirds made him feel different from the giant yellow one he'd seen that morning, which had been wrong somehow. He peered through the window. Inside, sitting with his enormous backside wedged up against the door, was the fat one, Humphrey, wearing only a pair of boxer shorts and a string vest. He had a white bucket beside him and was scooping up a handful of pink stuff from it, pouring it into his mouth and then lit licking his fingers clean. But it wasn't Humphrey that made Darkus gorp.